All right. Good evening, everyone. It's Tuesday night. It's time for another USA Hockey Officiating Zoomcast episode. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is BJ Ringrose, and I am the manager of the Officiating Education Program at USA Hockey. Tonight is episode 38, of which we discuss altercations and fight altercations slash fights and those things that do occasionally pop up in our game, managing players, managing teams. We're going to discuss a lot of the aspects of altercations, why they occur, and uh, ultimately how do we uh, separate players and, and uh, manage players and, and deal with the aftermath. So uh, joining me tonight, we have two excellent panelists who come from not only a great USA hockey background, but have also worked their way up into the higher levels of our game. Uh, first, uh, Steve Staler. Steve Saylor comes from the Ocean City, New Jersey in the Atlantic District, uh, USA Hockey official for 17 years. Uh, has been through an entire summer camp program, starting with the uh, regional flash slash futures camp, and then worked his way up to the process and attended our program of merit, and have used those camps to springboard and do a great opportunity and a great run through the junior officiating development program, which has now landed him both in the ECHL, so working double uh, uh, A minor pro hockey, uh, as well as he's also an IHF referee. Also joining us is Billy Hancock. Uh, B Billy Hancock comes from the Lake Villa, Illinois area, so a greater suburb of the Chicago area. USA Hockey official for 15 years. Like Steve, has worked his way through our summer development camp program that springboarded him into our junior ODP, where he had a fantastic run with that. And he's used that to work his way up to the higher levels of the AHL, um, so a AAA a minor pro hockey, and as well as he's an IHF linesman. And he'll be actually down in Dallas later this year uh, covering the under-18 world championships. So uh, we're well represented there. Uh, for those uh, who may not be, uh, may not actually been involved in one of these Zoom casts before, there is an audience participation component to this. Should you have any questions or comments uh, as we discuss our topic for tonight, feel free to use the Q&A feature in your menu on your screen to submit questions to the panelists as well as myself, or feel free to throw any comments or questions within the chat feature as well. And those will come directly to us and we'll do the best that we can to ultimately answer those. With that said, as we typically do with our Zoomcast episodes, we're going to start with a poll. And this is a really, really quick one. Two really quick questions. First question, altercations and fights happen due to, and you got a range of possible answers. Second question, select all of the skills important to managing players during an altercation. And it's a multiple choice. So you can pick any... Uh, all or one and we'll just give you 10 20 seconds or so to submit your responses to that poll okay pencils down getting back to our poll questions i shared the answers with you uh, altercations and fights happen too and as you said i gave you a menu of options to pick from although it seems all of you i think this might be our first ever 100 percent answer in recorded history of all zoom casts so far uh, the answer choices I gave you were retaliation from a game incident, uh, an attempt to disrupt an opponent's game flow, boiling emotions, or poor discipline of the teams. And of those options, most of you had picked the bottom option, which was actually all of the above. And that's really the, that's the reality of it. Altercations and fights really do start for lots of different reasons. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as we get into the uh, discussion portion of this episode. Uh, question number two, select all the skills important to managing players during an altercation. And again, it was a multiple choice. So you could pick from the menu. Uh, the menu items being awareness, communication, skating, rule knowledge, and positioning. And all of you chose communication, which I think our panelists will agree is a really, really strong skill to have when you're ultimately managing players during an altercation. And the rest of them, awareness, skating, rule knowledge, and positioning, kind of ran in that 75 to 80% range. So most of you agreed that those were uh, strong skills to have as well. So thank you so much for participating in that poll. Uh, I wish I had a prize to offer, but unfortunately, I don't know points awarded or anything like that. We don't keep score here as far as I know. So with that, we will get into uh, our discussion part of the, uh, of the episode. Um, so as we talked about in our first question, you know, why do altercations occur? Um, you know, they really do happen for lots of different reasons. And I'll, I'll start with Billy. You know, you're the one out there as a linesman working games. You certainly interact with the players probably a little bit more because you 
being in face-offs, involved in face-offs so often, you really probably uh, interact with the players a little bit more. Referees interact when they have to, if there's a message they have to send or if they have to have a discussion with a player, you know, certainly they'll engage and interact with the player, but linesmen really do seem to be in the thick of it. Um, you know, do you kind of agree that like retaliation and grudges would be one strong reason that, that, uh, that an altercation or a fight might occur? Yeah. I mean, especially nowadays with a lot of teams playing back to backs, um, it might not be a game you worked the day before, or it could be the game you worked the day before, but you hear from a player like, Hey, number 72 ran a guy from behind, uh, last night, you know, if you know that team, they might even tell you we're going to go after him. You go, okay, we know that now. So now when you see, you know, number 72 on the ice for the other team, you kind of have your, your ears, uh, your uh, antennas up looking around saying, all right, who's going to go after him first. Who's going to take the run. And then, you know, the other team who their big guy may be the, uh, the aggressor, if you will, um, you know, who might go run after him uh, if anything happens. And this stuff happens all game long too. You know, you see a big hit happen in the first period, you got to be aware when that guy comes either out of the box or there wasn't a penalty called um, that they might have a retaliation after that or retribution. It could be something that happened the first game of the season. Now we're on game 38 and, you know, you um, have to keep your eye out for that kind of stuff too. So whether it be pregame research or talking to the players, talking to um, your partners who worked games before, um, but retaliation retribution definitely is probably one of the top reasons why a fight or altercation could occur during a game. You bring up a really interesting point because it sometimes it's in game and sometimes it's more of a long term thing where let's say it happens late in the game and just nothing really comes out of it. Say it's late in the game and an altercation doesn't maybe it's a close game and the team just can't afford it. We can't afford to you know, go running after him right now. We got to keep our heads straight. We got to try to win this hockey game. Uh, so it may not happen in game. It may be the next night or the next time they play, say the next weekend or the weekend following like that. And it kind of bring up a really interesting point. If you work for a league in, in particular, and now that we're seeing more and more leagues forming with uh, even youth hockey associations, being more engaged and learning more about those teams really kind of keeps you in the know with that history amongst the teams and who the troublemakers are and even where trouble may brew. And I'll throw this over now to Steve, like just having that knowledge about players and the history of teams really does kind of, um, you know, prepare your expectations for what the game, for what the game might be. Correct, Steve? Definitely. And that's, like you said, it's doing a little bit of homework and knowing the teams when at all possible. Um, like Billy mentioned, linesmen have a lot more of that face-to-face -face interaction throughout the game. So as a referee, I know I rely on the linesmen quite a bit to let me know what they're hearing from the players when they have more time to interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then also as a referee, since I don't get that much time, it's, it's the awareness is even more important because I have to be able to pick up on small cues. Um, and on top of the, you know, retribution for things in the past, it could also be understanding that, you know, a good team is off to a bad start early in the game. They're frustrated with themselves or a team's got a few game losing streak. That's all things where their emotions could boil, but not necessarily because of another team. They might be frustrated with themselves. It's a great response, Stephen. It ties really nicely into our next bullet point uh, that I wanted to discuss. So I love it when the panel just is right there in the groove and flow of things. Uh, the second item and, and the second answer, I believe it was in our poll question was disrupting the game flow. And I sure I'll kick it right back actually to Steve is I'm sure you've been involved in those types of games where a team comes out of the gate really, really rough, slow, sluggish. Their opponents jump on them and suddenly all of a sudden they're down three nothing and they're still in the first period. I'm sure you've, you've seen those types of incidents where now all of a sudden the team wants to kind of mix things up. They'll do an extra poke or make those kind of disrespectful things to kind of stir the pot with the other team to disrupt their flow, correct? It could be as simple as, like you said, giving an extra poke or at the whistles. It could just be their own frustration or it could be them trying to goat the other team into getting off of their game and try to play a little bit more of a rough style so that they can gain an advantage. Um, but that's, it's really important to recognize. And some key things that I look for are, you know, one heads down body language of players. Are they getting frustrated? And another good signal of when a team might start that is after they're down a couple goals and you see the coach start to get on them. If the coach is all over their team, that emotion is going to carry over to the ice more often than not. Thanks, Steve. And I'll just go quickly down to Billy. Like you start to see that Though those little things start occurring. I mean, certainly you position yourself in front of the bench as the line's been constantly you start hearing the, the, the coach getting on the team and firing up the team. You know, you're in there interacting with the players. You're certainly picking up on little signs as well. Correct. Oh yeah. All the time. It's, 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 uh, 
it's also being aware of who's on the ice, right? Because if, if a team's getting down three nothing now, and like you said in the first period, they're 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 struggling and they can't get anything going, and you see that one guy hop on the ice, we'll say, you know, last time Johnson, you see Johnson go on the ice, you're like, all right, this guy, all he does is he tries to start things, and like you said, it could be as simple as a simple poke, it could be a little shove after the whistle, it could be trash talking go to the bench, and they're just trying to get under the better team's skin. The other team might be a very fast, finesse, skilled hockey team. The other team is a very physical team. And right now nothing's working for them. So you got to read that temperature um, from the coach, from the players, and see who's going on the ice. Because if the coach sends out his, I guess for a lighter term, we call it a goon or, or a aggressor, he goes on the ice and you realize, okay, they're trying anything right now. They're desperate. The, the, the hockey's not working for them. So now they're going to try to get under their skin. And it's whether it's being that person or um, just like the communication with the coach and hearing the bench talking about it. Cause referees don't hear that communication. The benches, that's what we hear. You skate by the referee and give him a tap and say, Hey, they're saying this guy in the ice every other shift. They've been talking about running somebody to get some, to get some flow going. They want to fight somebody to get some, uh, um, uh, I guess momentum going for their team. Uh, just be on the, be on the lookout for it. Sure. And just one of the, they want to turn the, turn the tide basically, and uh, disrupt the game flow of the other team who's basically having great success right now and get their, their team right back into the competition of the game. I think we can agree that like sometimes it just boils down to emotion as well. You know, it's a tough, tough matchup. Uh, sometimes the emotional element gets in there through the spirit of competition. It may be a grudge match and eventually sometimes emotions boil over and ultimately a fight happens or a fight may occur uh, due to that. And that's just the nature of our sport. I don't think, and uh, I'll ask you both this question, um, starting with Steve. I don't think fighting will really ever go out of our sport. We can certainly do things to uh, reduce it and certainly take out the, uh, you know, the pre-staged nonsense and all that kind of stuff that really has no business and it does nothing for the, for the, uh, the glamour and the competition of our sport. Uh, but there will be those moments where just emotions just purely boil over and fights will, uh, will happen. Do you agree, Steve? Uh, absolutely 100%. I, and I think the most important point in that, in that thought process is we can't take that personally. Things are going to happen out of our control. Sometimes we just have to be prepared and know how to deal with it. Yeah. And you make a really, really great point. You could be calling a perfectly good hockey game, a perfectly good bang on with every single penalty and Billy's out there nailing every icing call and every offsides call us face offs are perfect, but for whatever reason, just due to the competition, the spirit of competition, and just for whatever reason, one little thing just sets the game off just because just on based on pure emotion. Um, you guys have talked a lot about um, just kind of reading the temperature of the game. And I think that's really, really something, a, a strong skill. You won't necessarily find it in USA hockey manuals. Uh, you won't really see it talked a whole lot in seminars, but that's really where we uh, kind of succeed here with these Zoom casts is talking about some of the stuff that you'll find outside the boxes, reading that temperature of a game. So you know, the red flags, the little things that pop up that, that kind of uh, set off signals in your head. And I'll, I'll go to Billy now is, is you out there on the lines watching players, you know, is there anything that you look for or anything you can think of that just kind of pop in your head like, okay, it's on. You know, temperatures rising. I, I got to get my game face on here. I got to got to get ready. Yeah, um, when you have the guys going after and making big hits now, like they're going around and they're starting to. I don't want to say head hunt, say head hunt, but they are still going around and um, hitting more aggressively than they were before in the game. And you also have the, like I said, the pure emotion. Teams being frustrated. You know that they're losing five nothing. They're got, something's going to happen, or you you, you want to be on the edge of something will happen. It might not, but you want to always be prepared for it. Um, a big hit happens, uh, whether it be a penalty or not a penalty, um, a hit from behind into the board, uh, you know, a slew foot, anything. Like, you got to be aware of that kind of stuff. And I've always been a firm believer in the fact that as a linesman, you have to be a good referee as well. You have to referee the game as a linesman. You're not actually calling the penalties out there, but you recognize when there's a bad play or when there's a good play or whatever. Because even if it's a good hit, you still got to be ready. Like, that guy just got destroyed, and it was a beautiful hit. But who's coming up to defend them? Because nowadays in hockey, it's sad to say, but we do have a lot of good hits that still people have to answer the bell and um, fights do happen or scrums happen because of a good hit because they're mad they hit their best player kind of thing. So that just because it's a good hit doesn't mean nothing's going to happen from it. You always got to be aware of what's going to happen following that incident. Yeah, you make a really good point in, in the sense that, you know, a hit may occur. The reaction 
after the hit, immediately following the hit, sometimes in those smooth tracks, tra- you know, track meet type games, the hit occurs, everyone keeps moving. Like there is no like basically staring at each other or basically the little retaliation push or something like that. It's just bang into the boards and on we go. But then all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, you know what, that body check suddenly turns into the, the little elbow back or the little push or the little slash or something like that. That all of a sudden turns into just a, like a minor little retaliation that, okay, emotions starting to set in now. This isn't necessarily just an up and down competition. Obviously, they're getting a little frustrated with one another. Um, Steve, can you think of anything else that uh, might pop into your head with regard to red flags that just suddenly, uh, you know, I got to start getting ready. The, the, the temperature's rising here. Uh, probably almost every single time a goalie gets hit. If a goalie gets hit, I have a pretty strong feeling that the cavalry is coming to support them. Um, and I'd like to touch on the comment that Billy made about linesmen helping the referees, especially in a three man system. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to Billy when I've been working with him and asking him for pieces to the puzzle in games where there's like BJ was saying a late hit, something like that. Um, but other, other big red flags would be, as a referee, if a team is complaining or trying to make their point frequently that I'm missing stuff, if they feel that I'm missing stuff, I, I think that they're going to start to try to take matters into their own hand and protect themselves. Whether I saw it 100% and I know in my heart that it's not a penalty, if they feel like they're getting slighted, that's a pretty good red flag that they're going to start trying to get some retribution for themselves. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. I mean, another thing that kind of pops into my head too is, is how players respond after the whistle, you know, the good smooth hockey games, goalie covers the puck. And for the most part, everyone goes away. You know, the attacking forwards, they basically skate off. The defense don't really do anything. And all of a sudden going from that to suddenly where it's just, it's, it's everyone assumes they have a free shot after the whistle where the attackers don't necessarily go away and immediately back off from the goaltender or the defenseman immediately gives the big old shove cross check shove or, or push to the player uh, just because he happens to be standing there. You, you see that kind of that uh, evolution of, of basically the respect amongst the two players and the two teams of, you know, about competition. It's all fun and games out here right now. It's all smooth versus the pushy shovey nonsense kind of stuff where you suddenly realize like, all right, the disrespect, the level of disrespect is starting to uh, dissolve here and uh, something may start to stir up quite possibly. Um, So we talked about reading the temperature of the game. We start to see the the temperature rise and we start to see players start to stir things up a little bit. Maybe the uh, attacking forward comes in and takes a little uh, entitled poke at the goaltender, or maybe uh, the Forward may hold up. Defenseman comes and just basically gives him a big old shove away from the goaltender just because he happens to be standing where he's standing. You know, is there any skill or anything that the officials can do to kind of put out those little fires before they become bigger fires? And we'll start with Steve. Anything pop into your head of trying to manage the little things before they get bigger? Uh, Communication is huge here. And it's verbal communication. It's physical presence. It's even what you decide to call Um, in the scenario that BJ just explained, if temperatures are starting to rise a little bit and we have someone come in and give a shot, I think that's a great opportunity to take a single minor penalty, not a coincidental show them that you're not going to tolerate it. And the team will be penalized for that. Um, Using your communication, telling all the players that you see what's going on, that you have a penalty, explain what penalty you have, let everybody know. Don't be the extra guy. Don't take another one. I already have white, keep your power play, just communicating what you see and what's going on clearly, precisely, and kind of keep it short. You don't have to have long drawn out conversations like that. Absolutely. And I think on top of that too, I think referees in general have to be very careful with that kind of communication because they're, they're essentially drawing lines in the sand suddenly. Okay. No penalty there or whatever you ultimately decide to call. Let's say you go with no call there. It wasn't that bad, bad a push, but you know, something kind of, you know, uh, popped on your radar as far as I need to talk to that guy and cool him out a little bit. You know, if you draw that line in the sand, uh, you have to be careful with that because you're going to have to step up and answer the bell if they, if they do it again. Correct, Steve? Absolutely. If you tell them that the next time someone does something, if you set an ultimatum and they do it, you have to call it. Um, So being careful to choose your words correctly and not always what you say, it's also how you say it. 
Um, if you tell the guys you're going to call a specific thing, you're going to call it. I would stay away from setting ultimatums and tell them, you know, I'm only looking for one guy. Don't be that guy. Don't give them exact. The next guy that touches anybody is getting a penalty because there's going to be some guy that just reaches out and puts a finger on somebody to test you. And it's going to, you're going to handcuff yourself. So choose your words wisely and your messaging wisely and don't necessarily handcuff yourself into calling something that you might not want to call. That's another really, really great point, Steve. I think we, we don't emphasize that enough of choosing your words carefully. You know, it's great to be a good communicator and willing to talk to the team and walk, talk to the players, but we do have to be careful about what we say and how we say it. Cause otherwise it could be completely misinterpreted or your mess. Yeah. Your message could certainly be delivered wrong. Um, and next thing you know, your credibility is gone. If, if you uh, set yourself up for failure with your words. So any type of communication with players and coaches is important. How about you, Billy? You're in there basically pulling players apart and, and dealing with players, uh, on a slightly more uh, personal level, quite a little more frequently than the referee, anything that you can think of that you, you know, when you're having those communications with players, trying to deescalate them a little bit. Um, a lot of it is just, uh, trying not necessarily being like the the good guy but you're the nice guy compared to the referee right so the referee is the bad guy saying i'm gonna start taking one i'm gonna, I'm not gonna take two people whatever you're in there going like hey man there's five minutes left in this in this tight hockey game why like come on let's calm down a little bit and then he might give you a reason like well he stuck me in the leg back there no one saw i'm like all right like you know i apologize you know we didn't see it but we'll keep an eye out for you right you're you're talking to them trying to defuse the situation and the worst thing you can do is uh, is uh make the situation worse like coming in and screaming hey 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 we're done like just screaming like what are you doing get out of here like you want to keep it level i mean let the referee do the yelling let the referee blow the whistle let the referee call the penalty your job is to come in there and kind of calm it down make, make a joke you know i'm not the best at one-liners when it comes to players i have a different way to communicate with guys but if you're good with one-liners and it can be, make it make the guys laugh and kind of calm them down that's perfect like there's nothing that we say we can't joke around the players like have have a good time out there and make it more fun for them and also more fun for you and it's going to make the referees job a lot easier because you can calm calm the situation down a lot more but i mean i know we're going to hammer this communication topic this entire uh zoom cast but it's it's huge i mean with referees and linesmen referees kind of more not saying all the time but more the bad guy and we, we get to be kind of the, the, the cool good guy like all right guys like he's gonna start calling penalties like we're talking in the locker room this is your last chance like that's it like you guys really need to calm down unless you guys want to play shorthand the rest of the game or if you see already has a penalty being called guys you already got one 55 is already going do you want to make it worse or you already have a power play coming up like that's a big hockey iq thing and knowing what's going on as a lion's man when you see that the referee's already calling a penalty maybe he poked the goalie or maybe it was a, a hit in the corner that no one else saw like, hey, why are you going shorthanded? You don't need more or don't, don't lose your power play because referees in the corner of his arm in the air blowing the whistle. We're in the middle of that talking to them to try and defuse situations the best we can. Wiseman, well, Wiseman really kind of our on ice psychologists sometimes when you think about it. It's, it's basically, it really lies on linesmen uh, constantly to basically de escalate situations and talk players down. I, I know I certainly did uh, when I was on the ice talking players out of that retaliation penalty or something like that, where Steve, Steve has the, the minor penalty and you can just already tell that the, whoever that opponent was that the penalty was on, you know, he's looking to react. He's, you know, he's looking to respond and, and figuring out a way to get in his head and talk him out of that retaliation foul and basically calm him down. Um, one question from the uh, audience, and uh, I think this may go to Steve only just because it's kind of a referee related question. When I see the temperature rise up, I often end up calling a tighter game. What are some tips to not back yourself into a corner to calling a super tight game? So we're talking about penalty standards and reaction to temperatures rising up. Uh, what can I do to respond to this, to keep the game on the tracks? Hopefully, um, can you tighten up your standard? Can you change your standard mid game? Uh, and if you do, what are the risks of, of changing that standard? So there's a few different ways, uh, things I want to address here. Um, so when you talk about game management itself, it's this very sensitive topic and I've heard it talked to you about, you know, if you catch a butterfly and you have it in your hand, okay? If you squeeze too tight, the butterfly is gonna die. And if you open your hand too much, the butterfly is gonna fly away. And that's exactly what it's like trying to referee a hockey game. You wanna keep it tight enough that the game's not gonna get away from you. 
And if you squeeze too tight, you're going to suffocate the game and everyone's going to get frustrated. Um, and I think the easiest way to answer that question is we have to do what's what the players can expect and stay consistent. Um, I don't think I would necessarily change the way I call a game as much as just be more aware of what's happening. If there's big hits and there's stuff like that going on, I know I can't miss anything, but I'm not going to start making things up or call things that I otherwise wouldn't. A penalty is a penalty is a penalty is a penalty. We can't miss them, especially in a game where temperature is rising. But I don't think that you ever want to start changing your standard in a hockey game. I think we have to keep it consistent. And this way, everybody that's involved knows what's coming next, what they can expect. If we start changing that up on them, it's going to add to the frustration and it's going to cause the temperature to continue to rise. Yeah. All great points, Steve. That's, that's really where those communication skills really, really play effective because you don't want to change your standards. You don't want to over start over penalizing the teams trying to, to manage the game overall. We can't control the game. We really, really can't. That's, that's kind of a, a, a myth um, within the hockey culture that the, the officials control the game. The reality of it is, you know, the officials can call penalty after penalty after penalty. That's all we can really do. If the player really wants to slash the opponent, there's nothing we can do to prevent them from slashing the opponent. We cannot control players. All we can do is call in response to what they do. Now, we can manage players by using good communication skills and trying to talk them and trying to cool things out a little bit. And even if the temperature's rising, we haven't really discussed it a whole heck of a lot, but talking even with the coaches. And this is where I talk a little bit of when I talk about communication is remember who you're remember who you're getting frustrated with. The players are acting out. Is it a product of the coach? Is the coach fired up or is the players getting unruly? Where if I talk with the coach and make the coach aware of my expectations and he needs to tighten, uh, put tighten up his grip on his team and his players a little bit, he could be an asset. Versus, you know, if, if it's a total product of the coach, the coach is winding up the players and the players are running around like animals then you simply have to just rely back on your, your penalty standard and all that, I think. Um, and I want to circle back real quick to the comment that I made earlier about you can't take this, this stuff personally. Um, it's nothing that you did. So by you changing your standard, it's not going to help anything because nothing that you have done to this point in your standard is what has gotten us here just to piggyback on what BJ said. So, you know, you, you just have to kind of take a deep breath and, and take it as it comes. Don't start adjusting things. And always remember that, like we've been saying all night, it's nothing that you did yourself that caused this to happen. That's true. As we talked about earlier, you could be calling an absolutely perfect game up until the X factor point where suddenly something happens. And it might have been just a competitive play to the sideboards where a guy leans in to, to lay a check on a guy. And the other guy catches a rut or something like that. And suddenly what would normally be a normal body check all of a sudden turns into a blow up boarding infraction. And suddenly the game starts to fall off the tracks up until then. It's been a perfectly smooth game, but something set it off. Uh, and you did absolutely nothing wrong. Now all of a sudden it's on you to basically kind of manage the situation and manage the game and try to keep it out there on the tracks. Um, so let's say we get to that point now where the things really kind of start to spiral and we actually have a full on altercation, full on fight out there on the ice. And I'll start with Billy. Um, you know, as far as managing those players and interacting with those players, lots of things come to mind, like, you know, being aware of, of stuff occurring after the play and finding that hot spot and finding that fight immediately after the whistle and getting there. Um, what, what are some things that, that kind of flash in your mind when you're thinking you're entering into an altercation? What are you thinking? Um, first thing is uh, where your partner is, because you want to make sure you have someone coming in there with you. Um, if the altercation is uh, pretty aggressive but if you just have a couple of kids shoving um and maybe just you know yelling at each other you got to realize uh be as aggressive as you have to be so it could be as simple as stepping up and staying between two players and they're going to skate away right but if you come in there guns a blazing screaming grabbing guys that can make the situation a whole lot worse and you also have to realize communication with your partner and the position of your partner so you guys aren't both coming in and grabbing the same player. Because if you have two guys going at it and we both grab the red player, the white guy now is free reign, right? Because he's being held back to go at, after it. And it sounds silly, but it happens all the time. There's a lot of times where we just go in, not, don't even think about talking to each other, saying, I got red, you got white, or, uh, or whatever it is. But 
Uh, I think a lot of it's just there's a lot of premeditated stuff going on when you're coming into a situation. You can't just jump into every single altercation and think it's going to be the same as the last one. But the biggest one, I think, is just the aggression part of it. And I, I know aggression might not be the best word to say, but it's just being as physically involved as you have to be. It could range from just standing there and talking to them, standing between two people, or actually having to get involved and break people up. Um, but then again, communication with your partner. And again, over camera communication again, but it's, it's huge. You know, talking to who you want to take, going back to back in the scrum, not grabbing guys from behind. Um, and the number one thing is your safety too. If you have two guys going at it and there's no way to get in there that's totally safe for you guys, there's no, no reason to risk your own safety for two players that want to do what they want to do. And going back to what BJ and Steve were saying earlier about the uh, uh, doing what you can do to alter the game, nothing you do in that scrum is going to fix it. If two guys want to fight, two guys want to throw punches, they want to rip each other's helmets off, you won't be able to stop that unless there's a good chance for you to get involved in that. But so they're rolling on the ice and their skates are flying everywhere and stuff. That's on them. But then when you find a safe time to jump in, that's you want to jump in. And again, communication with your partner. You look at him and say, now let's go. And you go together. You're not jumping in from the back. You're not doing chokeholds. You jump in together. And we'll get into that in a second, I'm sure. But um, just communicate to your partner and knowing when to jump in and when to intervene and how to intervene and how much force to use. It's funny you bring up the communication with a partner. One of my tragic stories of working junior hockey was I was the veteran. I was working with a less experienced guy. And we actually had a normal fight. Two guys stand off and they, they engage in the fight and we step in to finally break up the two players. And I call across to my partner. I said, I have white. And what I hear from the other side is me too. So the first thing that ran through my mind was me too. Second thing that ran through my mind was the opponent's fist went right in and I took a shot to the head. So it really but does like strong communication, realizing which guy you have and everyone has their man and, and they're uh, managing their player involved in the altercation. Um, what are some things, Billy, as far as stepping in, are, are there some times where you like you talked about safety? And this is one of the reasons I put skating as a skill in that poll question. Skating really is an important thing. Um, when you're talking, when you're dealing with players who are strong skaters, the officials have to be strong skaters too, if you're ultimately going to handle that player. Um you know, what are the things that are the, we got to step in now, you know, there's times to stand off and basically wait till a safe moment, but there's also times where we got to go, we got to get in there. What, what are those uh, instances? I think the most common one would be that players fall down the ice. So if you have, you have, you have a full fight going on, gloves are off, they're going at it, players fall down the ice. That's usually when someone's going to gain advantage because they're on top of the other person. Now, in higher levels of hockey, we have the benefit of having players knowing when to stop. So it makes our job a little bit easier. But in the lower levels of hockey, you have kids, you have, like we talked earlier, the emotion going on and uh, in the back of their heads. And that's you got to jump in and try to actually break these guys up. Uh, another one would be you want to worry about player safety as well. If someone's helmet comes off and you have a chance to get in there, we don't want players falling down, hitting their heads in the ice. And, you know, we've all seen situations that can end up being disastrous for players and that happens. So anything you see, like a helmet coming off, a jersey over the head, a jersey comes over the head, it's hard to see through a jersey. So if a guy can't see through it, that's the time to jump in, help out that person who now is blind pretty much. Because when you can't see punches coming at you, it's kind of hard to punch back or do anything back in return. Um, and then I, the other one would be blood. I know that this is kind of like a, a wishy-washy subject some people say if they're bleeding not a big deal but if you see someone breaks their nose or they have a huge gash in their head and you see a chance hey guys we can jump in now uh that's a good time to jump in as well because you have a guy who has a, a visible injury going on you want to try to break that up and again the communication that's you're talking to guys like hey guys he's bleeding he's bleeding we're coming in we're coming in and you come in together with your partner it's not you jump in and surprise the players you communicate them too all right guys we're on the ice we're done he lost his helmet, we're done, you know, that kind of thing. And hopefully in most instances, instances the guys will react to that and respect your um, intervening. But, uh, yeah, I'd say falling down, injury, helmet off, um, blood, um, jersey over the head, uh, that, that, those kind of situations are time to jump in and finish the altercation as fast as possible. Great. All great stuff, Billy. All right, I'll pass it over to Steve now. You know, we have our, our altercation, our fight breaking out. You as the referee – now, the, the, there's a kind of a one piece of advice that rolls around there. You as the referee, you let your bouncers bounce. They're the ones out there basically breaking up the fights. 
Uh, you're the, you're almost kind of like the manager of the restaurant, manager of the saloon, basically standing back and kind of taking stock of what's happening. What, what are the things that kind of uh, roll through your head now as you got that altercation stirring up? As it's starting, I definitely want to have a good idea in my mind why it started, because those are probably going to, that's going to be the player or the, the small number or group of players that get most physically involved. So I definitely want to have in the back of my mind what caused this to happen. Once the altercation breaks out, like BJ said, 911 shows up, linesmen come in, they're doing their thing. I want to be far enough away from the situation that I can see things like a third player come in or the guy come off the bench or the goalies skate to center ice and start to engage each other or what's going on in the backside. But I want to be close enough that I can still communicate with players. And if there is a penalty that me communicating, hey, I have the hit, I called the penalty, might bring the temperature down, I want to be in that sweet spot. So far enough away to see everything or as much as possible, but close enough to communicate. And I think it's important to know that in that situation, that's not the time to get into long-winded conversations again. Emotions are high. Players are going to be loud and screaming. If you're going to say something, make it short, sweet, and make it count. Make it something that is easily digestible for them in that moment. And we can deal with long conversations later. If there's one player that's floating around trying to get your attention while all that's going on, you're working right now. Tell them you'll deal with them in a second. But I think especially at the lower level, it's important to, to make sure that we can see the benches and what's going on because nothing is going to get it going worse and two players engage and, you know, someone gets slew footed from behind on the other side. Now here comes the benches. We need to see as much as possible. It's really the trick of it because you, you do. There's a lot. It's unlike the linesmen are in there basically managing the two players involved in the altercation. They, their responsibility is really those two players. And once they get those players apart, they'll help you out as far as the penalties with regards to those. But your your mentality, your focus really does have to be all those other players on the ice. And uh, you, know, you uh, talked about not getting distracted, too. But I, I think positioning also plays a little bit of a, a role here, too. You know, putting yourself in the the correct position to see as many players as possible. Correct, Steve? Correct. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So we've talked uh, quite a bit here. We've got a few more questions rolling in. Um, go to Steve again with this one. Um, at the youth levels and below – actually, no, this one's probably a little more for Billy now that I think about it. At the uh, youth levels, uh, under 18 and below, should be uh, 18, uh, 18 U, by the way, uh, when breaking up altercations, we are often criticized for the force we apply to terminate the altercation. Is there a correct amount without being accused of being too physical? So that's something that certainly we're, we're held accountable to as linesmen, correct? That basically as we go and engage with those players, particularly at the youth level, especially if you may be uh, dealing with a player who may be your size, maybe even a little bit smaller, uh, we have to be kind of cognizant and, uh, you know, careful about uh, how much force we apply. Correct, Billy? Yeah. And uh, going back, circling back to what I said earlier about um, knowing how much force to apply in a situation, uh, it's, it's hard to demonstrate without having, like, you know, I guess being in person and be able to show how to break an altercation up. But it could be as simple as just reaching your arms over and grabbing their arms together like that. And that's all you have to do. But um, when we get into the uh, instances of putting players in headlocks because we go in improperly. We go in from the back, and the only thing we can do is grab them from the back and grab them from a jersey or from the neck or from the head. Uh, if we can go in and grab their arms, that's the best way to do it. I know that's in the perfect world. I know it never happens, and it doesn't always happen that way. Or if it's simple as just coming in and grabbing your hands and pushing on their chest a little bit. Now stiff arming them, just grabbing onto their chest, and that's it. You just come in slightly, push them away, that's what you want to do. But if you can clearly see that somebody's being overpowering to you, I'm not saying that you should ever take a player down, nothing like that. But that's where you can grab their arms, you twist them up, and you talk to them, you, you calm them down. Because the more you start yelling, the more you start being more aggressive with your tone of voice, the more angry they're going to get with you. So going back to being kind of like an on-ice psychologist, like BJ said earlier, you know, you, you want to talk them off the ledge you're tr trying to calm them down you're saying it's the ref it's the ref it's the stripes i'm in here that's it we're done we're okay and you get to scam away a little bit you keep talking to them just calm them down a little bit 
But I think when we get into most issues is that we come into a altercation improperly, like I said, from the back, or, uh, you know, we're just grabbing the guy because we think that we have to go in full 100% force on these guys. Like, we don't have to. I mean, I, I can maybe count on one hand how many times I had to use my full force to break somebody up in a fight. It should never really ever happen in a game, especially with these levels. Great. Thanks, Billy. Billy, Billy ahead, I Steve. heard uh, one, of, one of your good friends, Charlie O'Connor, he would always say minimum amount of force necessary. The absolute minimum that you need is the only amount that you should give and for only as long as you need to give it. So less is always more when it comes to the amount of physical intervention that is used on a player. I can't think of a better way to summarize it. Really, really good point to add there, Steve. Okay, we've done quite a bit of discussion here. Now we're actually going to uh, share some clips um, and uh, discuss some of the things that we see here in the altercations. Since I'm guessing uh, might be one of the reasons a lot of you uh, decided to join us tonight, you just want to see some good fight clips. Okay, quite a bit to see and watch and discuss with this clip. Billy, what are the, some of the things that pop out as you watch this? Um, first thing is that, uh, you know, we have to see that as linesmen, what's, or I guess this is too much of fun, but anyways, as linesmen, we're going to see what is starting this. So who is the aggression situation? And when we see it happening, we want to go to the, what we call them as hotspots. And clearly we can see where the hotspot is right here two guys cross-checking, punching each other in the face. Um, and then we see from the corner, number four on the dark team comes in and delivers a pretty high cross-check. And now he becomes the main aggressor situation. Now, the problem I see here with our uh, officials is that we aren't really communicating. We're just kind of going and grabbing players as best we can. And we also see, we we're talking about the over-aggression in this role, I was mentioning earlier, um, we can definitely tell this is a little over-aggressive because we came into the situation improperly. We grabbed the guy from the back, put him into a headlock, and now it looks like we're wrestling the guy at the ice. I'm not saying this official was purposely trying to hurt this player, but from perspective-wise, it doesn't look great. Um, this is where we need to have better communication with our partners and going into finding a, a situation together. And I know we'll see a, a clip a little later that will show a good job of them going together to separate altercations, but it's just staying together with your partner because we get separated. This is how stuff can escalate and we can look like this and, and properly handling a, uh, a player. It's almost like we have to be aware of our positioning and what we're doing uh, in the sense of where we're grabbing a player. Like if you're, in this case, like you're this official here where you clearly have the guy that my right arm is now tangled around that player's neck. That's not good. Me as a linesman, have to, I have to recognize that that is not, I'm not in a good position to manage that player. And I'm putting that player at actually pretty serious risk uh, by grabbing him around by the neck belt like that. If, if, uh, we, if we both fall down to the ice, I could fall down on top of him. Uh, or if he falls down, suddenly I got my arm wrapped around his neck and I could uh, end up choking him and putting him into some sort of choke holder. He falls down to the ice. That's one where I think you just, you have to let him go and restart yep. almost. Yep. Steve, I, anything I, I to add? Say, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Billy. I, I would just say that, I mean, I haven't mentioned it yet, but it's more like taking your time. So I think when we see the, the temperature boil over and altercation happens, we just think we have to break up as fast as possible. And I think more of it is taking a deep breath and it comes with experience. You see more of it, it, it comes easier. But like you said, you let him go, you reset, take a deep breath and get around the other side of the guy. And then you can do a better job of it. It's not just because here you can clearly see they're, they're trying to break up as fast as possible. There's no, no technique to this whatsoever. It's just, we need to stop this. And it made the situation worse. 
Steve, anything to add in? Yeah, I think uh, Billy did a really good job already of identifying what the major issues in terms of penalties are going to be. We have these two that go at it first, and then four comes in and is, like Billy said, the main aggressor in this whole entire situation. So I think in my mind, as I'm trying to manage and referee the situation, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm going to probably work backwards. I know these two kind of – there's not really one big glaring thing that starts it to me. These two kind of go at it in front of the net. So I'm, I'm going to work backwards. I know that I need to have the dark team – down coming out of this with a penalty and the light team's going to have a power play. So the, the biggest thing that we can absolutely not miss in this clip is for coming in and being third man in first intervene. However, you want to label that I'm even almost okay with calling a separate major on him for just coming and hitting the guy in the head. Um, but, but keep it simple. Not every single player that, you know, on the ice here, I know there's two other guys on the, on the left side of the lines right now that eventually will get tangled up. Not every single player needs a penalty, only penalize what we absolutely need to penalize. I think the three players that were involved, the two players on the dark team and the one on the white, if we penalize them, I think we're good here. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. All right, we're going to move on to our next clip. Okay, let's break this one down a little bit. Now we just got a pretty much whether it's a goal or a start of a period, we got a typical standard uh, center ice face off here. And since uh, at this point, really the referee is kind of the main focal point as he's getting the uh, play going again here with a center ice face off. We'll, we'll start with Steve. What kind of pops into your head when you watch this as far as uh, what uh, the referee did right or did wrong or could have done or what's uh, what are you thinking? So at the start of a period uh, or start of the game when the referee's dropping the puck at center ice we're, we're already at a disadvantage because there's going to be players behind us that we can't see um with that being said if i have players behind me i'm probably not going to turn around completely like this and leave four players behind me to address two players unless unless there's some major infraction that i think is happening behind me i'm going to trust the linesman to keep the players behind me set for a face-off if I do need to turn around, I'm probably going to take a stance more like the one where he was just in, where he's not, doesn't have his back, like stop right here, right here. His back is all the way turned. I don't like that. If I was going to turn around and talk to them, I'd probably try to keep my chest open more up and down the ice so that I can still out of my peripheral, see a little bit of the players at center ice. But again, I think turning around to address the face-off position of two players and then turning my back to four players here isn't – I'm not getting enough bang for my buck by doing that. I trust the linesman to set the players behind me if that's all – the only reason why I'm turning around. As the clip rolls, the referee is going to turn around, and he probably heard that slash, and he turns around to a cross-check to the face. And now the wingers start to get involved with each other because temperatures are beginning to rise. At this point, we see the referee's body language. He doesn't really do anything. He just blows his whistle once and glides over. I would be much more vocal at this point and have more of a presence to let them know that we're not going to tolerate it. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Maybe more presence diminishes this whole situation and nothing happens. Maybe it doesn't. If the players decide here, I don't know the backstory of what's going on prior to this. Maybe they're going to fight regardless. 
but we have to at least try to have more of a presence. I, I think we can definitely be more proactive in this situation. So once everything starts and now everyone's together, the referee goes from here being in a bad position because he's got the benches behind him with his back turned and he quickly realizes it and he takes himself wider and behind so that he can see everything that's going on and he can see the benches. Now, if we pause right here, this is what I'm talking about. We're far enough away that we can see everything, but we're so far away that any communication that he has, if he wanted to deliver any, is probably not going to be very effective. So we need to find that happy medium. Really good point there, Steve. It's You do have to have some presence. It's You can't be so close that you're missing uh, the bigger picture, but at the same time, you're so far, you're in a whole other zip code. You're, you're like the referee might as well be in the third row at this point uh, that basically you're not engaged and, and present within that fight whatsoever. Anything right. else? The only other thing I would add is, is when we see, you know, when we go back, if we're at the beginning of the clip and when the guy cross checks him, right. We talked earlier about not, not bringing the level or escalating with our own actions. But I think at this point, to a certain extent, almost the same way that we do with, you know, physical intervention, we need to match their level a little bit. He's too lackadaisical here. When this cross check happens, I'm probably going to get a little bit more animated to let them know, like, I'm here, I'm paying attention, I'm in control of the situation, and we're not going to let it happen. There, there's almost no body language, no presence from the referee whatsoever that would show anyone in the building that he has control of the situation. Again, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. If these four players decided 10 minutes ago that at this faceoff they were going to have this fight, they're going to have this fight but we still need to have a bigger presence and be more in control of the situation. Thanks, Steve. Billy, what do you got on this clip? Honestly, a lot of good things. Um, you know, we have the scrums or uh, the slashing happening behind the ref. And also there's a little, uh, I said the cross check in front of the ref right there and the slash happens behind him when he has his back turned. Um, and it looks like the linesmen realize that and they realize that something might be starting here soon. Um, and then we had the first guy come in, uh, first linesman, and step in between both both players. And I know we're talking about going in together, but here it's okay to kind of step in for a second, guys. Hey, come on, let's calm down, because then the partner's right behind you, right? It's not too over, overly aggressive at the beginning of the play where it, you can't handle it yourself by just stepping in between them. You're not necessarily breaking them off. You're just kind of be like, guys, let's mess them up, right? Um, and then hopefully that was the end of it. But then we have a line brawl, if you want to, uh, call it that begins right here. We have two separate fights happen with third with the third couple of guys uh, kind of wrestling each other. And clearly you can see right here, the linesmen, they identify which fight they're going to go to. Uh, one of the guys actually points to it and I'm sure they're communicating to like, Hey, we're going to these guys, we're going to these guys. They stick with them. They wait from the fall of the ice. They break it up. They carefully and uh, quickly es escort them to the penalty box. And then they go back and help break up the second fight that is happening. And this is pretty much the way you want it always to go with linesmen. You stick with the fight you're with, you get the players, you take them to the box, you take them off the ice somewhere, um, get them out of there, not on the ice. You want them off the ice and away from the play. Um, and then you go back and defuse the second situation. So um, it's just a good note to add that you never leave a player like so if you broke the, break that first fight up and we leave the guys there. Okay. You guys are good now. Right. We're good. You skate away. What's going to happen. They're going to start fighting again. So you get in the penalty box, you put them away, make sure maybe the door is closed and then you go back and defuse the second situation. Um, so this honestly was probably done by two very experienced guys and did a very good job doing it. Hey, thanks Billy. Let's move on to the next clip.
Okay, Billy, what do you have here? Um, well, first, we obviously have a pretty uh, big hit that happens back there. Uh, and the Lions does a good job of actually – he has – and it looks like an icing being called. Um, on am not sure what's going on. But uh, he actually has a good presence of actually watching the play while he's making the icing calls. He's not turning his back to the play. He's keeping aware of what's going on. So that's good. Uh, hit happens, and uh, White is looking for retribution against the guy who hit his teammate. Uh, so this is one of the situations we're talking about, uh, retaliation. And – they Lions does a good job skating into it, waits for his partner to show up because this is a pretty aggressive fight, and then that's when they decide to jump in. Uh, the white player is obviously being a little more over overly aggressive because of the hit, and the linesman, I say, do you want to play in a second, next couple seconds, uh, do a good job of breaking these guys up. Uh, Lions with the white player takes him away and takes the Tony box, and the other guy is standing there. This is when you want to have a little bit more initiative to get the guy to the box. Because now he leaves the player alone, and now we have more stuff that picks up after that, right? Not saying it was him that was involved in it, but you have to get that guy the box to get him out of there, and then you come back and you deal with the next situation in hand. You don't just leave the guy there. The other line is good initiative saying, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Because a lot of times you'll have a player telling you, well, he's being my guy up right now. It's like, well, when I get you the box, I'll go back and help him out. But I'm not going to leave you standing here by yourself. So the one line does a good job of being a player of the box. Other one – needs to have a little more initiative taken either off the ice because he's the one who delivered the original hit. He might begin a game's content here or whatever. Get him out of the situation. I don't care if it's penalty box um, to the door to go to the locker room. This has to be off the ice. Um, and then that's when we can come back here and break up the second fight that does eventually start. Um, I would like to see him go the other pile of this situation here, but they are sticking together. So that's the one good thing. Yeah, it's a good point of, of basically dealing with when you're dealing with those first two players. Yeah, you might have that opponent, like in this case, because uh, the white player is getting uh, the 14, I think it is, is getting taken uh, over pretty well here by number 31 black. You know, that white teammate who you just separated might be saying, well, what about my teammate? What about that? I can't deal with that until you get to the box. I can't deal with that until you get put it on them. It's on them right now. You quicker you get to the box, the quicker I can go rescue your teammate. It's on you. I can't. That's my procedure to follow. Steve, you got anything? Yeah. So before we go any further, I hope that everyone on can agree that when we take advantage of a defenseless player on the ice, that has to be a match penalty every single time especially the second fight where 31's pummel on the guy, we can, that's not hockey. There's nothing going on there for the game. That's just one guy trying to hurt another guy. Um, in terms of presence, it's better than the first clip, but I still think there's some areas for improvement. So we see his arm up at the beginning of the clip. He's got a penalty on the original hit. He does a good job of coming. So he knows the linesman, if we can pause right here. When he goes over to the second pile, he knows that the linesmen have the original two players. So he doesn't necessarily need to have all of his attention over there because the linesmen will know what's going on over there in that situation. So I would put most of my attention to the scrum of other players. So right here, he's in a much better position. He's come around close enough where he can communicate, maybe slightly too close in this exact frame, but he can see the benches. And he's close enough to communicate that he has a penalty. If we roll the clip, he kind of abandons that good position, turns his back to the bench, and then gets so far away that there he recognizes, oh, I need to be over there to try to put a lid on that. I think if he's closer and kind of stays in the position where he was and can communicate with these two players that this needs to be done and maybe even can just put a hand on his shoulder like, hey, I'm done. We're stopping. I don't necessarily think in a three-man system that I would completely physically intervene there, but we have a defenseless player who's down that's vulnerable. If we're closer to that situation, that might de deter the player from doing it if we have good presence in his ear. And it might, if we can slow that down, stop the other players from coming and getting involved. Because the only reason 18 gets involved here is because his guy is getting absolutely destroyed and he's defenseless. So if we're back where we were originally by the blue line, I think we might be able to prevent some of that from happening. Uh, 
Oh, right great. here. If he stayed, if he stayed where he was and he's communicating to these two players, we have a much better chance of slowing or, or mitigating that situation. Yeah, I almost wonder if he maintained his position between the board, the players and the boards, somewhere along, along there, uh, the blue line along the boards, maybe 18 doesn't respond. Because right now, 18 positional wise, 18 is in front of that referee. Mm-hmm. I don't see any officials dealing with this right now. And my player is getting crushed getting absolutely crushed right now. No one else is handling it. No one else is dealing with this. I got to jump in and rescue my, my teammate versus if you're there talking to the players, using your communication skills, you might deescalate that. You might get in uh, the, the black team, black players ear to, to basically get them to stop. Look, you won the fight. It's over. It's over. Stop throwing punches. That's a great point. Sometimes just being there and being seen is a deterrent. Okay. Really good points, guys. Let's move on to another one. We'll do a couple more, and then we'll wrap things up here. Um, Okay. Billy, what do you got here? Good uh, awareness by our linesman here. Uh, good agility to get in there as fast as possible and the defeat situation to pretty much nothing. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. And uh, good physicality with them. Uh, we didn't use a lot of uh, grabbing players. And more was kind of like in there real quick. It might have been a slight grab because they were done and that was it. There was no manhandling. There was no being too overly aggressive to see grabs right here, say, we're done, we're done. You let them go. And now we have to go in the box. Uh, big thing here, though, is that we have a very calm situation, which right here could have gotten a lot worse. Uh, the Lions can do a good job of being traffic cops in a way, directing the penalty box to make sure they don't cross. Because all it takes right here is, even with you standing there, uh, the white player, the blue player decides to spear somebody or slash them or say something. Um, and that's what makes the situation uh, a lot worse than what it was. Uh, they do a good job of making sure they're separated. I would say maybe even better. Uh, the Lions with the white player could stop the white player and say, hey, let's hang on a second. Let them go by because they are pretty close here. Uh, but that was the only thing I'd say is just to kind of keep those players separated as much as possible, but always stay with them. And they do a good job of this. They don't let them get too far away from them. Uh, you know, they don't let any more physical contact come between the two. Uh, this is a good job. And I assume they're talking to you saying, good job, you know, Hey, let's go to the box, take two minutes and we'll be done with it. Yeah. I think it, it, positioning is key here. Just having that awareness of where the opponents are and having the, the good mindset of, of positioning yourself correctly with uh, respect to where those opponents are. Now, if this linesman who's managing the, the team white player, if he's positioned behind him or on the other side, he doesn't have a chance of cutting this player off but because he had the good mindset of positioning himself uh, between the opponents. He's in a much better position to get in front of them and to manage them more effectively and cut them off when this potential uh, traffic incident comes up. Steve, you got anything to share here? Much better presence. Um, he gets in there. He's clearly talking, communicating, blowing his whistle, getting their attention. In the perfect world, the only thing I would change is right here, he kind of skates past the players he's penalizing, albeit he does skate backwards and keep keep everyone in front of him. But I would probably just take an extra second. There's no need to race them to the box. If you do get in front of the players, though, I love the way this referee turns his back or skates backwards and keeps everything in front of him so he can see what's going on. There's no surprises. But overall, very good. Okay. All right, we'll do one more.
All right. Billy, what do you got? Uh, clearly a pretty, uh, pretty big hit in the corner down here. Um, trying to see the number of the, of the big player there. Can't see um, we are, we should be aware of who delivers that hit, right? Cause that's going to be who people are going to go after. So we see who that, who delivers the hit. We go to that guy first. Um, if he's involved in the scrum, then we want to go, we identify which fight we want to go to. So right here, we have our linesmen stick together. They identify who they're going to stick with and they break the fight up. Right. Uh, they jump in. Uh, we quickly, we see the red player has lost his helmet. So that's a good time to jump in. Um, if you can, if it's safe, like you said, you're talking to the guys. I'm sure they're communicating. And that's going to take the players away to the box. And we have a second fight going on, which right now in a game, when you're on the ice now, you have no idea that the second fight's happening, right? As a linesman, you're focused on what you're doing. You're breaking it up. You turn around and say, oh, look, a fight. But now we have a little help from our referee friend, uh, you know, diffusing the situation. So I'm not saying we want to be slow and lax here. Um, we want to have a little bit of a pep in our step, getting the guys off the ice into the box and go help the referee out because, you know, his job is not necessarily to break a fight up. But we are taking our time a little bit, which is fine. We're not rushing, scanning the guy out the ice, pushing him, being over aggressive, get him, out, get him out there. But overall, another good job. Our linesmen sticking together, doing one fight at a time, getting the guys off the ice, and then going back and defusing the second fight and helping the referee out. Great. All good. Really, really good points, Billy. Steve, what do you got? Uh, first thing I notice in the clip is this hit. And the first thing my eyes did when I saw the hit was look at the time on the clock. It's a four to one game late in the game. You can probably make the argument that the player that got hit was off balance. And you could also probably argue that it was a board, um, depending on how you see it. But number one, we know that we have a big hit and immediately my antennas go up okay it's a situation where both referees do a really good job of supporting each other the low referee you can't see him in the frame but he's right in the corner right there with every player in front of him with his main focus on this original fight and especially the players who aren't doing anything right now so in this situation he knows the linesmen have the original fight he doesn't need to put a ton of emphasis from his attention perspective there he's kind of seeing what's going on with all the other players because that's where that the next potential issue could be the the first big one's already being dealt with by the linesman the high referee is doing a great job they're doing a great job of working together and not focusing on the same area they have two sets of eyes and they're using them together and that's probably the biggest takeaway from this clip as the clip rolls, the second these two get separated right here, the referee's attention turns because he knows the linesmen have those two. Nothing's going to happen. And he watches the players behind the other referee who's helping to intervene. It's great all over by keeping, you know, an eye on players who aren't involved and antenna up in a wide field of vision. And this, this uh, clip almost kind of ties into what we talked about in the last one by this, this high referee coming down and engaging with these two second fighters. Suddenly he's a presence there. He's talking to these two fighters, all these other players that are out there on the ice, watching all this go down, suddenly see that referee there as the, the presence and dealing with this. So none of them necessarily feel the need to step in themselves. Now the officials are there, point. they're on top of it. They're handling it. You know, let them do their job. We'll sit back here and tap our sticks. Cause you know, we appreciate what just happened. So with that, I mean, Really, really good comments on all of those uh, clips that we just shared. And uh, we really, really appreciate uh, you guys sharing your insight and your experience. So with that, as you have noticed, we have reached and breached the top of the hour. Uh, I've spilled over uh, over our 60-minute limit as usual. Not, uh, not uncommon for me. But uh, we'll take a moment to uh, wrap things up here. So I'll uh, share my screen one more time. We're going to talk about the upcoming schedule that we have. Upcoming episodes, as you can see, we're dealing with altercations today. Next week, Officiating Hockey IQ. Scott Zelkin is going to be in the captain's chair for that one, and he is going to be joined by J.B. Olson, who is a junior officiating development program coach and supervisor, as well as Kelly Cook. Kelly Cook is a uh, highly respected, well-established NCAA official referee from the Boston area, and she also works the IHF levels, working her way up through the IHF ranks on the women's side. They're going to be joining Scott and talking about, again, sort of like what we talked about, a little outside the manuals, you know, outside the seminar kind of stuff. The more we 
are cognizant about what's going on in the game. You know, reading those red flags, reading the players, reading the plays and things like that. What are the little things that can pop out that, that make us better at our job? If we can understand the systems that teams are playing or, you know, basically the mentality of players out there and understanding those little things suddenly make us more effective and better at doing our job. So should be a really, really uh, entertaining and informative episode coming next week. After that, we go with competitive contact. We're going to talk about the USA hockey game as a whole, uh, whether it be the body checking or just body contact and where the lines lie between those two entities within our, within our sport and the things, uh, good elements of good body contact uh, and good body checks and the things that should immediately pop in our minds as red flags of, we must penalize this because this is not within the, the scope of body contact or profit body checking. And then on April 13th, we have the junior ODP and Scott Zelkin will be leading that one to be joined by a couple of uh, supervisors and supervisor coaches from the junior ODP and talking about the program as a whole. That program has been around for uh, 20 plus years, been working really well as a springboard. And then our, our two panelists are perfect examples of uh, where that junior uh, fishing development program can uh, pave a great pathway to bigger and better opportunities for yourself, be it in college hockey, professional hockey, or on the international stage. Also, you noted on, on that schedule, uh, we have our social media channels on Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to go out there and find us and follow us. Uh, we have lots of updates blasted out there, or even just sharing no more social media content out there from our various members across the country. So go out there and feel free to engage with us. Uh, survey reminder, we have, after this episode's over, you will be hit with an email prompting you to fill out a survey. We always like your feedback. We always want to know how well we're doing with these. We want to know what you liked about the episode and what we could improve upon. No, no different from any other program that we do. We want to know what our participants' feedback is. And of course, that one important question where we ask, uh, what are your thoughts on upcoming episodes and what we can do for upcoming episodes? We're always looking for great ideas. Those surveys are your voice for us improving this program and making it the best program possible to serve our members. Thank you so much for you guys as the participants. If this is the first time that you've joined us on a Zoomcast, we look forward to seeing you here for many more. If you're one of our diehard uh, KG veterans or our cult following that have been here for multiple episodes, week in and week out, thank you so much for joining us so many times. And uh, we really, really appreciate your support. And we love doing this for you week in and week out. So uh, thank you for our panelists, Steve Staler and Billy Hancock. Thank you for once again, taking another hour out of your personal schedules and your personal lives to give back to USA Hockey and share your wisdom from the upper levels and uh, everything that you've learned working your games. USA Hockey really appreciates everything that you do for us. And with that, we'll wrap things up. So on behalf of USA Hockey and the Officiating Development Program, I'm BJ Ringo saying thank you for your dedication to USA Hockey.